Hello, I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack team, welcoming you to a new episode of Great Minds on Learning. In this series, Donald Clark, the internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning, from the Greeks to the geeks. This episode's thinkers were driven by a common belief that while practically all the attention and money is lavished on formal courses, informal means of learning account for a much larger proportion of what actually happens. So how should our view of learning change and what role does technology play? So Donald, this week's topic is closely related to uh, an area we covered in our previous episode on workflow learning. I'm sure the links will come out as we investigate this episode's topic, which is informal learning. We'll also be hearing about incidental learning and how those things fit together. So to kick off, can you give us an overview of how these different concepts relate to each other? Workflow, informal, incidental, and how have you formed this group of theorists for this episode for us? Yeah, so we did an episode on workflow learning, which is literally, as it says, learning in the flow of work. And there's crossover into this podcast, very definitely. But our focus today is going to be on informal learning. So that that adjective, informal. So we have these theorists, uh, Marzek, Watkins, Gary, Cross. Some of these people go way back to the 1990s, indeed some people before that into the 1970s, who were absolutely prophetic or you know, prescient on this. It's only now that the technology is allowing us to play this game and play to what they thought was right that their theory is coming alive again 30 years later. But uh, some of these people I knew, I met Gary in the early 1990s myself in Denver in in the US. Uh, Jay mm-hmm. Cross was a good friend of mine. He came and stayed with us here in Brighton. I, uh, you know, And I always leaned towards what they were saying. Even way back in the epic days and building a little thing called the Blender, which had informal learning as a learning mm-hmm. sort of route in it. And I was the internet was around and it was quite clear that people were doing a lot of their learning on these newer networks, newer forms of technology, primarily the internet, but also books, you know, I've got a rack of them behind me here. So informal learning has been underplayed because L&D has largely, not wholly, but largely been about the delivery of courses or Mm. formal learning, despite the fact that the overwhelming evidence empirically is that most people don't learn most of what they learn formally. This is the the mistake, you know, that Nick Shackland Jones and others make this point all the time, Roger Shank. You know, training is not schooling, (laughs) it's not education. And yet we tend to default back to giving them all these big theoretical courses. What is a leader, you know, and the theory of diversity and so on. But actually, that's not quite right. Most people need to learn this stuff in a different sort of context. So informal is exactly what it says, learning non-formally, almost non-intentionally, learning by doing. So all of these people uh, give us the learning theory that lies behind this. Okay, so let's get into the weeds and start off with uh, another duo. But interesting how many couples of researchers we get who work together. These are two who've worked um, together for a, a very long time, Victoria J. Marsick and Karen E. Watkins. Uh, Victoria Marsick is probably the better yeah. known. She's Professor of Adult and Organisational Learning in the Department of Organisation and Leadership, Teachers College, Columbia University, and a recognised authority on the learning organisation, on informal learning, which we're do, talking about today, team learning and action reflection learning. I interviewed uh, Victoria and Karen on the Learning Hack podcast a while ago, and I was very taken by their ideas about the interdependence of work and learning. So we're talking about work-based learning and then about learning-based work. So learning becomes the bit that you put first, which is really interesting. And and I was pointed towards them by Rada Sadki, who works with uh, large health programs, um, and really rated what they did and and, and was trying to put that into action, succeeding, I think. But to focus on their relevance to what we're talking about this episode, how does informal and incidental learning happen according to their account? 
Well, this is uh, so the, the the key text here was the informal and incidental mm-hmm. learning in the workplace. So the two words in there, informal and incidental, and that was written in 1990. So you know that's well over 30 years ago, and it turned out to be a really key text even now, and is well worth reading. Now, what what they did is actually pull some theory that went before them, and we have mentioned some of this in our previous podcast. So this actually goes back to 1930 and Tolman, behaviorist that we did in our behaviorist podcast on latent learning. Now, as he did an experiment with rats that showed that when they're in a maze, they just sort of toodle about a bit and get to know the the maze anyway, simply by bumping into the different channels and so on. In other words, people tend to pick up things just as they're doing things. And this is true in the workplace. So if we move forward from Tolman, who was the fundamental researcher on this in 1930, we have Coombs and, Coombs and Ahmed, I think were the names of the guy, who, who actually wrote a paper called Non-Formal mm-hmm. Learning. In other words, they recognized, this is back in 1974, 1973, they, they, they were quite, they recognized that actually most learning was not through formal training. We had Mocker and Spear in the 1980s, and they wrote, they had an interesting distinction between formal, non-formal, mm. and informal, which I think is actually right there in a, in a funny sort of way. Uh, there's a certain non, you know, formal and non-formal. There's a sort of split there, more loose formal stuff, and then informal. And then there was also Reichman's a very famous paper called En Passant, as in chess, oh, yeah. when you take the pawn. And it was, we learned just on moving forward, you know, just by, by being in the workplace almost. And that was about 1986. So we had this body of theory, you know, bits and bobs of research that pointed towards this great book uh, by Marsick and Watkins that said we have this incidental learning. This is a big word for them. Informal and incidental mm-hmm. learning, okay? So incidental learning, what is that? That's unintentional, you don't plan this stuff, you know, you get down with a piece of paper and say, it's going to be like this. It, it, it's the result, it's really the byproduct of work, you know, you get stuck, you need to find something out, somebody has asked you a question, a client has made a query. It's that notion of unintentional, unplanned learning, which, which sort of piques our curiosity sometimes, or it's a problem we have to solve, or a mistake we've made that needs correcting. This goes back to Bob Mosher's five moments of need type mm-hmm. concepts. But that's what informal and incidental learning is. I like to expand it a little bit and say there's always things like <laughs> accidental learning. You know, I have to think back to many occasions in my life where I've accidentally bumped into someone or had a conversation or come across a book in a second-hand bookshop that has been really a profound subsequent learning experience for me. And we have to recognize that most learning is like this. It's a bit messy, in other words. I think that would be, uh, there, there might be a better book to be written here called <laughs> Messy Learning. <laughs> careful, careful, you start a whole new school no. there. <laughs> yeah, but the good thing about, I mean, a, a good thing about these two researchers who work really closely is that they, they take the take experience and context of learning seriously. And in other words, that's the workplace. We're talking about workplace. You could do the same analysis uh, for education or schools or whatever. And the they, they start with a really nice analogy about, you know, about shopping, funnily enough, and the point of sale analogy. I quite like this analogy because learners are a bit like shoppers, you know. And I was when you're you really interested in buying something, actually when you're in the shop or you see the product in the window or you're handling it and so on. In other words, it's that point of sale, point of need uh, that you really get if you're delivering a formal course, you know. you. You know, when something's scheduled next month for Tuesday the 4th, and you've got to turn that up at a small hotel or classroom, and that's not, it's not, it's not the need that's driving that. It's just a timetabled mm. course, okay? You probably don't even know what, what the thing's about when you start off. What they're saying is actually it needs to be driven by motivation, driven by the self, and informal learning it doesn't take place in the classroom and structured courses. It's in the hands of the yeah. learner self-directed, not planned, all that jazz. But I I think another important feature here is the empirical recognition. So Jay Cross wrote about this, they all wrote about this, which is what is the ratio between informal Mm. and incidental learning versus formal Mm. learning? Now, Marsick and Watkins picked up on another research in 1984 called Carnival. And Carnival uh, thought uh, based on the sort of, you know, actually asking people and tracking what they did in terms of learning, thought that the distinction was 83-17. Mm. So we can roughly say an 80-20 yeah. split. 
let's say, you know. And I think that's right. And that's come through in the sort of 70, 20, 10 type uh, stats and so on. And we shouldn't get too hung up in the numbers. But the bottom line is most of it, a lot of it is informal, yet we pay hardly any attention to it. And Marsigan Watkins went on and then said, well, okay, if we know that this is true, that 80% of learning is formal, what do we do about it? Okay. Uh, because, you know, obviously we, we tend to learn when we've got a problem to solve or some sort of unmet need arises and that sort of thing. Uh, and th th what they, they say is you don't leave, don't leave it fallow like an empty field. You know, nurture this mm. informal learning. You know, you've got to encourage the informal and incidental learning. You've got to sort of almost induce it by giving, sort of, uh, you know, giving birth to it. And they thought that there were three main things here. One is, one is promoting reflection. Get people to reflect on what they're doing, what they need to know before they do something. Once you've got that sort of metacognitive idea that I'm not going to rush into this, I'm actually going to sit back and think about it a little bit, that's a good thing. Secondly is proactive proactivity by the learner. You've got to convince learners that it's actually their responsibility mm -hmm. at the end of the day to learn this stuff, as opposed to just going on courses and sitting there with your mouth open while people <laughs> shovel stuff in. And then the third one was this creative problem solving idea. Now, you have to get that mindset into people where, where work is, and it is a lot of the time, is about actually problem solving. You come across a problem, you've got to get it done, you know? So you've got to, in a sense, surface all these weaknesses you have and turn them into strengths so that you become a sort of learning-enabled individual. And I, I, I think that's what was great about the book. It, 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 it completely changes your mindset away from the course towards encouraging a sort of culture of yeah. learning. Now, they, they went on, uh, there was another book called uh, Sculpting the Learning Organization. I'm not a big fan of the learning organization. Mm -hmm. I don't think organizations are learning organizations. You know, they have a completely different set of goals. Learning is secondary, I think, in a, in a sense, where, where they use case studies. Uh, and then there are four levels. It's quite nicely split into four levels. The individual, a team, organization, and society. In other words, there are these different social levels within an organization that you as a learner have to op learn to operate in. And of course, this book was written, these books were written in the 1990s, early 1990s, 1990, 1993. The internet was still 10 years mm. away. When these newer technologies came along, suddenly everything they said came true was enabled in a sense by the technology. So suddenly people were using the internet all the time. If they're doing research, they're using Google Scholar all the time. They're not wandering up and down the shelves of libraries. So suddenly we switched to Google, YouTube, Wikipedia, trusted web sources, all that sort of stuff. And what they said actually manifested itself as being true in real behavior. And Jay Cross often makes the point that this 80-20 thing probably swung more towards 90-10. Right because of the advent of the okay, internet. Interesting. To, to go back to something you said very early on in, in your answer there uh, about point of need, um, that's interesting. And that yeah. comparison with the retail um, situation, I mean, uh, you don't um, sit down and research the different features of printer cartridges before you've even bought a printer on the off chance that maybe one day you will buy a printer, if you're not even considering it, you know. You, 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 you do that research when you want to buy the thing very much with, with retail. And this comes to something that, that also was um, talked about a lot, I remember in, in, the, in the early noughties when people talk about informal learning, which is the difference between just-in-case learning and just-in-time learning. So, so right. that's a part of that. Interesting to hear what you say about learning organization. I'm, I'm sure we'll get some feed, feedback about that. Um, but how how um, yes. significant was the Marsic Watkins con contribution to the idea of the learning organization? I think the fundamental problem with the learning or the fifth discipline, the very it's famous book, with the concept of learning organization is, yeah, that's right, is the more you try and talk about the thing of being a learning organization, the less it yeah. will be. I think that's what you can draw from the theories we're discussing today. It's not about formalizing mm. learning or using that adjective learning in the front of everything because most learning takes place without you being conscious of it being learning. We only become conscious of things being learning when it's in a formal course in a, in a way. You know, it's the L and D give us learning. But actually that's not quite true. As we've just said, all these theories say, well, that's the very opposite of the truth. Most learning isn't about that. 
it's learning accidentally, incidentally, unintentionally, as it were. So I'm deeply suspicious about this, let's build a learning organization, because I think the more you do that, the more <laughs> the more likely you are to fail in a sense, because it's sort of forcing formal definitions and so on of learning okay. at people. And there are other people who are less, of course, that you can have a much more sophisticated view of a learning organization, which promotes informal okay. learning. But actually, I see very few examples of that. Some, I think, uh, I think they're a very good example of, uh, you know, uh, Mirjam and uh, uh, Simon Brown in, in a large pharmaceutical yep. company who will use curiosity and motivation as a basic premise. Uh, uh, so, I, I, you know, I think there are interesting things happening around the redefinition of a learning organization. And that's what all this LXP and performance support is about. It's about completely redefining mm. training away yeah. From the order taking, the this conspiracy of convenience that Charles Jennings talked about, the order taking of courses and delivering them, towards being much more sophisticated and playing to how people really learn. How do real people in a real world in a real workplace learn? Well, they actually don't learn much from courses. They learn mostly by doing and in the context of the of of, of work. Gloria Geary. I can find no biographical information at all for Gloria Geary online. I don't know if that's my fault as a researcher or whatever. So I'm completely reliant on what you can tell us about it, Donald, because I know you met her. And beyond that, yeah. I think we also have to respect what seems to be like a desire for privacy. She's retired now. LinkedIn lists her as such, yeah. but is based in New York City. Um, her big book, however, is very well known and influential and High, increasingly high profile. Again, she was ahead of her time, I think. Electronic Performance Support Systems, published in 1991. And that was before the internet, as, as you said with the others, significantly. However, she defined an idea of technology supported performance support that people are still striving to live up to. We have the tech now, probably beyond um, anything that Gloria Ge Geary could have conceived in 1991. But when it comes to realizing that vision, Donald, are we there yet? Well, yeah. So, yeah, I met Gloria way back in the early 90s in Denver. I was sitting in the front row of a conference and we were both listening to Roger Shank, of all people. It was the first time I'd ever seen Roger speak. And my, he made my jaw drop, really, because I just agreed with every last word he said, even though the entire audience were howling with disagreement. Huh? Uh, uh, but Gloria was sitting and, I, and then I chatted to her afterwards and she was very self-assured, confident, and gave a really good critique of Roger, because she agreed as well that you know, much, much of what he said was right. But I found her very, very impressive. And this is the early 90s. And then I got her book, uh, the, that's the EPSS yep. book, so that's Electronic Performance Support System book. And that's all about re remaking the workplace, a complete re-evaluation of learning in the workplace, okay? Using technology, so remember, Gloria's primary interest was around the use of technology to solve this problem. That wasn't necessarily a uh, Marsick and Watkins approach oh, okay. to things. So 1990, we get Marsick and Watkins. 1991, Gloria writes her book and Jay Cross, the friend of mine, he had a big pile of her books and used to give them away to anybody who could find because he thought it was such a profound shift in mindset, yeah. okay? Now, she was the first really to come up with this idea, well, not, not necessarily the first, as I say, there were lots of precursors here in a sense, this idea you have performance-centered uh, design and you provide the tools or sort of context or support tools that help people in work. You don't impose courses upon them, you create an environment or ecosystem that allows them to solve problems. This is what improving performance is all about, as opposed to trying to give people doses of learning which they're most likely going to forget. This is a shift in mindset which is explicit in the book, okay? Uh, just in terms, of, uh, in terms of biographical details, it seems very much a loner here, but very moral and principled person. She went off to, she did work in Nepal in schools, work with, uh, you know, orphans and so on in Romania. She, she had a, a lifetime of, sort of philanthropic uh, uh, work as well. But coming back to Coming back to her theory in particular, there were a couple of precursors here. We yeah. mentioned some precursors for Marsic and Watkins. There was, and the Guy Wallace really documents this quite well. There was Gilbert and Romler from the Praxis Group in 1970 who published a paper, 
And they were really, really skeptical, just like Gloria Gary, about the direction of travel and training. They thought I'd gone hearing off in the wrong direction towards formal courses, uh, you know, separate classroom courses, because they were much keener on job aids, you know, uh, general checklists, performance mm. support. And then a guy called Gilbert wrote a book in 1978 called Human Competencies that was all about the sort of competencies people need. And he had a similar view of this, that informal learning was really important. Now, for Gary, what she did that was unique, and she wrote another book in, uh, just before this called Training Versus Performance Support. Mm -hmm. That was the, these two mindsets, what really matters. And she repositions performance support as being the major business problem. Actually, the problem you have as an organization is probably a performance problem, not a training problem. Yeah. Okay. And what's the solution to that? Technology. So she changes the whole way we design learning, pointing it towards the use of technology. Remember, this is a decade before the internet. Mm. Now, the shift from this traditional training to performance support uh, was not to separate it from work in any sense, but to integrate it, sort of web it, marble the fat into the meat, as yeah. it were, uh, so that it's part of work itself. So you don't you don't abandon all formal training. That that wasn't our point. You know, Marsic. J. Cross, Charles Jenny, all these people say we're not abandoning courses. We're just taking a more measured view of their efficacy, shrinking them down, have less of them, put more, a lot more of your budget into, into the informal side. And then she, on the EPSS concept, so that we're clear about what that is, a, that wasn't a traditional help system like the sort of Mr. Clippy that some of us older people remember popping up and was widely hated. But it's quite, it was then quite limited in scope because Alfred Remins makes this point that the early EPSS systems were mostly about helping people deal with new technology. And that was mostly things like Microsoft Word and Excel mm -hmm. and these enterprise-wide software systems. They all hit people in, really in the 1980s, 90s, before the internet. Yeah. You know, There was a lot of that being imposed upon people and they had to learn how to use this stuff. Remember, this was all new. We, forget, we think this stuff was around forever. Not really. Enterprise software was a big thing in the 80s, yeah. 90s, and, uh, and, and people had to learn a lot. So for her, you have this, an integrated and structured approach to help people, give them absolute, immediate, indiv individualized access across a network, with networks then, even though we didn't have the internet, mm -hmm. and, and you know, really good bits of information, software guidance, advice, assistance, to help them get past these problems, or to learn how to use the software. And that's what we do to this day. If we get stuck in a piece of software, we go, we go to Google or get a little bit of YouTube up and whatever and try and get around the problem. Hence the printer anecdote that you told earlier. Mm. Now, what has happened recently is we're managing to get to grips with the contextualization of that problem. Now, if you know what people are really after by knowing what they're doing, what their job role is and so on, you can make the target a little bit clearer. You know, you can get to the red bullseye as opposed to the, the little yellow circle just outside that. So we're increasingly trying to improve the personalization and targeting of EPSS activity. And that's what the more sophisticated performance support systems do. Mm. Interestingly, you have to sometimes do a lot of upfront analysis in an organization about what people actually do in their job. Yeah. And, you know, you can build these systems like LXPs, but learning experience platforms are actually a lot of front up sometimes analysis of what the workflow is is useful yeah. and then there's a further definition of this because after Geary she caused you know it was a big book this and it made people reflect on what it should be an EPSS mm -hmm. and then Barker and Bungeri came out it was about five years later and gave us trying to give a definition of this which is you have to have a user interface in a database you know you have to structure this as a piece of technology you then have to be very clear on the tools you give people you need a help system and every bit of software now has a help system mm. you need some documentation but you also need some retrieval you know you need to be able to go and find bits and bobs to help you and some intelligence are behind this some even some tutoring a little bit, simu mini simulations even sometimes to help people get around things yeah. and communicate that to people. And this is what's happening now today with smart content. Mm. I think the pro I'm writing a book at the moment, a history of learning technology, and I'm, I've just finished the content chapter. And the really interesting thing about content is it's not this big homogeneous bucket of stuff, which is how most people see it. And they're a bit pejorative about it, you know, a bit dismissive of it. But actually, that's wrong. 
Content is everything from a tweet, a little definition in a dictionary, right through to a flight simulator. It's hugely differentiated. And of course, massively available through informal learning because of the internet, mm -hmm. whether it's YouTube, Wikipedia, or Google search, whatever. And so we are now beginning to realize what Marzik, Watkins, and Gary said 30 years ago that informal learning can be realized because the technology is there. It's free, it's cheap, it's quick, and it's what people do anyway. Hmm. When I discussed um, EPSS with Bob Mosher, um, I was asking why it never became a, a product category. Um, you know, that people don't, you know, people market uh, LMS, LXP, and so on, but, but you, you can't buy an off the shelf EPSS. And I, I, I think what I, I learned from talking to him, there was really in each case it is so bespoke. And so you can use existing systems to support this, but for each organization, the EPSS would be a different thing because the nature of what has to be supported and, and learned and, you know, what, what, what that work environment is like is so different in, in, in each case. I think there are two things there, John. It's a really interesting point that Bob makes there. I think one, the EPSS systems became integrated with whatever you were launching. You know, so if you needed help on Excel, the help was inside Excel as a product. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, the internet became so powerful that whenever you, you know, even in Excel, I'll take that example. If you print, it, if you type in, I need to know about pivot, uh, how to work a pivot table or something, it gives you the steps in the first page on search on Google. Yeah. So there were two things there. One, the systems provided EPSS functionality themselves. And secondly, the internet became so good that it was providing it almost for anything in the known world or universe. Yeah, you could say that the internet has an EPSS called Reddit <laughs> or Stack Overflow or GitHub. Well, that's a good point as well. There were other forms of informal learning. I mean, on the social side, we have a whole load of social platforms there. Uh, you know, Slack, Yammer that were bought by, you know, of course, uh, Slack is bought by Salesforce. Yammer was bought and then integrated into Teams and Microsoft. So EPSS has always been a necessary condition for success. People just tend to fold it into bigger pieces of enterprise software, which was Bob's point and a, a good point. Yeah. Our next theorist under consideration is, I, I should just sort of say at this point that um, Bob Wallace um, slightly took us to task for calling him a theorist because he says he's a practitioner, which is, you know, it's quite true. I should say in this series, we're using theorist as a kind of portfolio word for all the people who cluster around this that we're talking about. Obviously, some of them are practitioners, some are scientists, some are not, some are thinkers, uh, and some are just wild cards. Um, so the next of these that we move on to is Jay Cross, uh, yep. 1944 to 2015. James Calvin Cross Jr., to give him his full title, was an American futurist, according to Wikipedia, who popularized and maybe invented the term e-learning. He says it emerged around him in some way yeah. and championed the cause of informal learning in business settings and it's called by many the Johnny Appleseed of informal learning which I think is quite a nice comparison <laughs> born in Arkansas to an army family attended Princeton and Harvard Business School with two years in the US Army in between he developed the first courses on the University of Phoenix which was uh, a, of course a, a, a really important landmark development in the early years of e-learning 1998, he founded the Internet Time Group with Jane Hart, Harold Yarke, uh, Charles Jennings and Clark Quinn. And it's no accident, by the by, that three of those people are featured on my other podcast, because personally, I was hugely influenced by Jay's writings on the Internet Time blog when I first began to learn about e-learning in the noughties, which I have to say is after I'd got a job <laughs> working in um, the learning industry in the noughties. And I was lucky enough to meet him and hang out at a, an exhibition. Uh, I found him really personable guy apparently liked whiskey as well he's a prolific yeah. writer and published author in addition to his widely read blogs he was a columnist for chief learning officer magazine and a guest contributor to learning in the new economy magazine remember the new economy that was a an idea yeah. at the time four books he wrote including informal learning of course which really nails this topic area Donald, you write on your blog, he moved us beyond traditional LMS and content model and beyond blended learning to a newer, more naturalistic model of learning. 
based on real behaviour and contemporary technology. But was he just a very good amplifier of other people's thought? How would you assess his distinctive contribution to what we're talking about here? You know, as, as I say, Jay was a good friend of mine. And I knew him really, really well. And I think far from being an amplifier, I think he was a very original thinker. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's right. But he had a lot of humility. You know, I, I think that's one of the things that people remember the most about Jay. He was quite a humble guy, you know, and, uh, you know, and he, he wasn't really keen on all this highfalutin language. He did indeed invent the term e-learning. That's absolutely true, I think. Okay. And then, you know, but, and then also, I think he really invented the term, you know, not invent the term informal learning, but really theorized and brought it to the fore, not only by evangelizing it, but writing about it in his book, Informal Learning. So he really is a theorist of informal learning. But I think to give you an example of something really concrete, which he did, was he focused rightly on a very practical issue, and that's what he called the spending paradox. So what is the spending paradox? Well, if it's empirically true that about 80% of learning is informal and 20% is formal, what on earth are we doing by spending all of our budget on the 20%? This, is, this makes no sense whatsoever in terms of return on investment. And so he always used to show this at the beginning of his talks, that little histogram. We spend all the money on the little bit of formal learning and courses, hardly anything on the 80%, which is why he wanted to surface, like the other theorists we've mentioned here, he wanted to surface all these other things, blogs, wikis, podcasts, peer-to-peer -peer sharing, aggregation, social media, the internet, all that stuff was a big deal to him because it was a big deal to everybody else. And empirically, that's what people were using. So, you know, we, we, we actually saw what he was saying is just look at what people really do in the workplace, you know, because what has emerged is a massive use of Google and YouTube and Wikipedia. People don't like to tell you this, but it's true. Just look at the, the weblogs. And so that's what he then started to point towards as giving us the success in learning. Now, a really important point here, and he used to say this all the time, was that he didn't want to crush formal learning in courses. He thought that was ridiculous, you know. In other words, informal learning needs to be amplified, recognized, supported, used, but it's only 20% of the equation, probably less, and getting smaller, really important point because I think as the years go by, we're seeing the relevance of the course diminish, which is why I think we're getting lots of specious courses now are, are in very abstract things, you know, we sort of run out of things where, you know, like uh, most people can pick up a lot of the competencies informally without going on the course. Mm -hmm. And so people are thrashing around looking for any old abstract noun like resilience or something to build a course around uh, uh, as opposed to real competencies. And so his was one of business focus, you know, not schooling, like Roger Shank and everybody else, Nick Shackleton Jones, this is not schooling. Stop with the theory, guys. Stop mm -hmm. right now. You're wasting too much money on that. People will just forget it anyway. It's about doing. So, and he was quite keen on this blend of workplace learning being a blend of the informal and formal. But that doesn't mean that everything's left to chance. That, that you know, so you mentioned earlier, John, the stuff on working smarter. So he did not want to leave things to chance and had concrete recommendations around that. Okay, isn't there a, an apparent contradiction in this though? Um, he, or, or, you know, the, it, his, uh, you know, the paradox of the spend 80% going towards the, 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 the formal when that's only actually kind of 20% of, of, of how we learn. You know, it's a useful crowbar, that idea for opening the debate up, but isn't it there? It's like paradox that the informal stuff is going on anyway. Um, you can look at it and observe it, but if you start to get involved with it as um, a, a, an L and D manager, doesn't it then become formalized in a way, and you kind of kill the thing that 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 that, that was really good about it, which is the informality. So, I mean, what do you do with inform? Do, do, do you kind of support it? I mean, how do, how does that really work? Do you enable? Do you channel it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, the point was that you need to encourage it. Let's use that word encouragement for a moment. Encourage curiosity, encourage learning, encourage these, these systems. But many of them say, well, that's not enough in itself either. That's a motivational issue. You also yeah. have to put the technology in that allows them to do it. So in the early days, this really did happen. You had major organizations that banned Google and YouTube and Wikipedia. Mm. 
you had yeah, that in education Facebook, history. Well. There are many universities that ban that actually locked out Wikipedia. That's now seemed ridiculous to us. But this happened because people did believe, stupidly, of course, that all learning took place in the lecture room. It was just a ridiculous idea. So I think what all of these theories say is the technology is here, it's getting better, more powerful. You've now got one of these powerful little things in your pocket. Uh, all of the, uh, the smartphone, the more this happens, the less you need to rely on formal learning. Not, that's not to say you shouldn't rely to a degree on it, but it's getting a smaller portion of the mix. So you don't want to decimate the training department. You said you want to see learning as, as, as constant in an organization, but you want to reduce the barriers, make it easy, which is where behavioral economics comes in. You know, if you've got the, like, the nudge unit, you know, nudge he's there, making yeah. easy, timely, simple, attractive, you know, that, that's, that's what EAST stands for. And so I think we're suddenly realizing that's right. Let's make things easy for people. Let's nudge them. Let's notify them. Let's use LXPs. Let's use performance support in this ecosystem as well as the formal courses. So there, I don't think the contradiction then disappears. You know, technology, since the invention of writing, has swung the pendulum towards the learner. And that's right, because you swing the pendulum towards the motivational features of the learner. And as long as you give them the right things to access, you can swing that pendulum away from formal classroom teaching, blackboards and flip charts towards that rich set of resources that gives you answers to almost everything, which is the internet. But more than the internet, it may be internal resources. Uh, it may be things uh, specific to your organization. So you might have to search within the documents, PowerPoints and videos you have stored mm -hmm. within behind the firewall. That's what the LXPs and increased search capability gives you as well. So all this performance support, that's the key term here, the word support, really matters. Perhaps with Jay there is a similar question to ask us with Gloria Geary, the, the, the are we there yet thing. I, I remember at the time when I was reading his Internet Time blog a lot and going to all the kind of the, the tech shows and working for, um, uh, for vendors of, of e-learning technology, it, they just seem such a, a kind of uh, a, a strong contrast between what he was saying, which seemed to me to make absolute sense, and what people were actually buying and yeah. selling in that marketplace. You know, you had the LMS, very much a kind of admin piece of ERP, and you had the self-contained module content courses. And he was saying something completely different. Um, and it just seemed this the, these two narratives going on that were completely yeah. uh, at odds have has that disjunction improved now are we really getting there with this stuff oh i think we are i think the lms paradigm the lms as a platform and the vle in education were places that managed stuff managed learners and managed courses managed curricula and so on we're now seeing a radical shift away to a much smart I'll call it smart content and you know, been, that's been my view really for almost 35, 40 years that we should have been doing this, but it's now coming to pass. So we have the LXP market, which has exploded really, uh, people at Learning Pool and so on. So the I think it's now coming to pass. Uh, you see the speakers, you know, you still get that old paradigm stuff uh, because that's what people are continuing to sell. But there isn't an LMS vendor on the planet now that isn't looking to rebadge it as an LXP or add LXP functionality or retrieval practice type stuff or nudging or AI or data. Everybody's playing that game. And it's what all these theorists told us had to happen. Hmm. Now, when it comes to platforms, we had LMSs and VLEs. That then sort of shifted slightly. We suddenly started get we have webinar type platforms and so on. But you started to get social platforms emerging as well, collaborative platforms, things like Slack and Yammer. And then we've got Microsoft Teams all of a sudden. So you can see this is happening now. It sort of happened over the pandemic, I think, a little bit as well. This switch mm -hmm. towards, you know, people having to do it for themselves. But let's give mm -hmm. them the tools that allow it to do do it for themselves. So there's always been this stark contrast between these hideous exhibitions that you go to and you wander around it's just one lms after another and actually how people learn in the real world but to be fair uh, i think those vendors are switching now and understanding that these people were right all along 
and that you must have to move towards what I call smart content. And, you know, which, and, and, and interestingly, in building some of the tools around this, uh, you can build analytic tools using AI and very smart mathematics that determine the blend. And that blend mm -hmm. has to include a load of informal learning. So we've just built this tool which does precisely that. You put in how many learners you've got, what type of learning they're meant to do, what the goals, performance goals are, uh, what your budget is, and out pops a blend that is weighted towards informal learning. Because if you can do something for free, boy, does that hit your return on investment nicely. So people are spending far too much money on things that everybody else has done before, on big catalogs of content from Skillsoft or whatever, when actually what they may should be doing is designing the blend to include a big dose of informal learning in a structured fashion, of course, make it available to people, encourage them to use this stuff. That's starting to happen with LXPs, performance support systems, the opening up of informal learning through search. So we're getting there. Yeah, yeah. Now we come to uh, a section of this episode about which I feel most trepidation. The Learning Hack Pronunciation Department uh, has been working overtime with me on this particular section, but don't hold out any high hopes. I'm gonna, not going to slip up here because this is extremely difficult stuff. So the name of our next theorist is pronounced. Um, I have the, the useful mnemonic from your blog, but I, I, I take no responsibility for this because it, it, it's potentially sexist. It's pronounced chick sent me high. Me high, chick sent me high. That's correct. Um, is, is the name of our, I, I apologize to him <laughs> and to any Hungarian people. I have some Hungarian um, in my genome as well. So it's even more shameful. Me high, chick sent me high, 1934 to 2021. The problems aren't over yet. He was born in Fiume, 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 <laughs> at that time part of Italy, which is now called Rijeka, and it's in Croatia now. I think I know how to pronounce Croatia at least. His father was a diplomat who became a restaurateur, and actually I have a lot of trouble pronouncing that word restaurateur as well. <laughs> it's a nightmare, Donald. He emigrated to the US at the age of 22, uh, studied at the University of Chicago, where he later became a professor. And he's known as the father of flow, uh, a very famous concept elaborated in his seminal work of 1990, Flow, the psychology of optimal experience. Um, feels like he connects us again to the effective domain of learning, which we covered a couple of, couple of episodes yeah. ago. But what would you say is the relevance to our theme of informal and workflow learning? And I'm sure it's not just because flow is the second syllable in the word workflow. Yeah, I, I similarly had a massive problem with the pronunciation, so much so that this actually happened to me. In 2019, I was in a restaurant in Moscow of all places, and the guy opposite me at this dinner was Hungarian. And he mentioned Mihai Csikszent Mihai as a name, and I didn't recognize it. And then suddenly it struck me, I didn't know this guy, I had actually read the book Flow. And then this guy was Hungarian, I said, oh yeah, he's the Hungarian. He said, no, 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 he was not Hungarian. And then he gave me a little bit of the biographical back. He was actually turned out to be one of his students. He said, no, the name comes from a village in Transylvania. <laughs> this is bizarre. Mm -hmm. And, and as you rightly said, there are that whole area has changed geographically. So even though Hungary yeah. didn't have much application, to be honest. Uh, uh, but he gave me that little mnemonic, which I put in, uh, as you rightly picked up on that, Czech sent me high, is the way of doing it. His first name is Mihai, which is exactly the same syllable. So you have a double hit on the problem with mm. his name. Uh, we should maybe just call him MC. If we, if we go forward here, John. But anyway, you know that, I, you know, he, Anybody who's read the word, you know, read about his theory and flow, you just quietly nod internally and go, that's right, isn't it? You know, it's absolutely spot on. It, you know, if you think about what you do personally, for me, when I'm writing, I remember when I used to be coding, you know, on the computer or reading or cycling or walking, or even, even sometimes when I'm talking at a conference, I'm absolutely in the moment, you know, I'm losing track of time. Uh, I don't know if that's true for you, John. You know, we play music. You know, that your background is for decades as a musician. Absolutely, and for writing as well. Yeah, I mean, it's the reason why I can't be called into supper. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you know, if I give them four hours to to write a blog, it will be three hours of procrastination. 
And then as, you know, my um, my, my daughter very memorably described it, uh, an hour of all the work while crying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but actually during that, that, that hour or even half hour where the work is all done, it, you're in the flow state yeah. and you completely lose track of time. You move into a different kind of time appreciation of time, almost a different dimension of, of, of time. Yeah. Um, and I actually believe that I have a pet theory here. I shouldn't bring these into this you know, arena of two thousand uh, two and a half thousand years of, of, of really well qualified people. But my, my theory about procrastination and creative people is that it's the fear of the flow state. Because once you get into the flow state, there's no getting out and you completely lose that ability to, you know, have a, a, a kind of um, administrative sense of what you're meant to be doing in your life because you just get completely task focused. And that that can feel a bit dangerous, I think. So we, we kind of avoid going into the flow, flow state. Although it is true what everybody says that, you know, there, there is a massive kind of pleasure and enjoyment um, in doing yeah, that as well. I think that's right. I think that procrastination point is well made. The, the interesting thing about this flow experience is it's not like the Seligman happiness hypothesis, you know, that's all about having fun. Far from it. Mm. Actually, it's sometimes the very opposite. It's the sort of tough, challenging nature of being in the flow that you get deep satisfaction from. So why I don't like theories of motivation based around fun and gamification and all that jazz, because it's not being in the flow. It's actually doing mm. something else. Being in the flow is absolute congruence with the task at hand. You know, you're at, when you're writing, uh, you know, writing a book at the moment, it's, it's hard work. But the satisfaction come from a deep analysis, the rephrasing of the sentence until you get it right is it's not fun. Mm. It's the very opposite of fun. It's tough, which is why people procrastinate. I think you're spot on with that observation, John. And that that's what that's what MC <laughs> you say the MC I think that's what he was after here, you know. So he had this theory of flow which he applied to experience in general, whether in the workplace in workflow or writing or music or whatever. In fact, he wrote a book called Creativity, Flow and Psychology, Discovery and Invention, which is about sort of, you know music and all that other type stuff that you've just described mm -hmm. there. But this being in the zone, being in the groove when the ego falls away, losing track of time. So every fiber of your being is just on the task, he thinks is mm -hmm. at the core of efficient learning. Now he did write an interesting essay on this called Thoughts About Education, 1991. And I, it really is a wonderful little bit of work here. He, he did, like all the other people we've mentioned, think that there was this ridiculous uh, gap between the dismal reality uh, of, of learning and expectations, okay? And that's what he thought his research was about. And I was, let's focus wholly and utterly on motivation here and things like procrastination and being in the flow. When you actually really look at how people learn massively effectively, it's like being carried away by a river, you know? These, mm. And the experiences are not rewarding like fun or getting a little badge or counter or score going up on gamification. These things are intrinsically rewarding. You're inside the task. It's what you seek. That's what you want. You want to be part of it, part of your very being. Now, mm. he also, interesting in that essay, because he's applying flow to learning, uh, he sort of cogitated on, on, on what the barriers to that might be. And the first one, which is exactly what you mentioned there, John, is fear. Fear is the biggest, that's what he identified as the biggest problem, which is actually what procrastination is about, in a way. You know, I think you use that term there, you know, you, you, you're a bit scared of jumping into it. And it's also fear of how mm. you might appear to others and what other people might think of, of you, you know, which is why league tables and so on is a horrible thing in learning. So th those things mitigate against flow, okay? It also mitigates, interestingly, against social learning a little bit. Okay? I mean, I mm. think it was interesting listening to Julian uh, Stodd in one of your podcasts he's talking about social learning being everything, but he's written 14 books, but he didn't write them in a group <laughs> or socially. And, and uh, I think uh, JM's, uh, sorry, uh, uh, MC's view of uh, learning is that it's actually not social necessarily. A lot of it is quite solitary. When you're tackling a deeply difficult task, you sometimes have to get your head down, get in the flow, in the zone, in the groove, and do it for real. And I, I, I really mm. agree with this. It, it, 
Yeah, it can be very individual, but it also, I mean, you know, if you're kind of playing a rock yeah. band or something, you, you can have a collective flow or, or doing anything with a small team and sports as well. You know, the team will have a flow. You know, if you look at a, look at a wonderful yeah. football team playing really well. Oh, no, well. there's no doubt about that. In fact, I, I, he wrote about this in, in some detail as well. It's not necessarily wholly, wholly solitary. Team context is incredible. Mm incredibly important dimension is in this as well but i suppose it's a mixture of both it's like being you know it's like playing jazz isn't it you you're in the flow with the other people and then occasionally you're breaking out into yeah. souls and that's you know there's all that there's a huge mixture here i think this uh, music uh, <laughs> metaphor is going to break up quite soon if i carry on with it but but yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. the important thing is still involved uh, for for mc it's involvement and focus you know and that sense yeah. of almost being outside of things, you know, you're not in life, you're in the task itself. You've, you've completely given yes. yourself up to it. Uh, and uh, yeah. he thought it was a bit of a tightrope, this as well. You know, there's a, you've got to be a bit anxious to do it well. There's a state yeah. of anxiety, not fun and enjoyment. And you've got to keep that mm. going because that's what gives you that sort of in the zone feel. It's almost serene, isn't it, when you're in that flow experience? Yeah, and did he talk about it as a kind of Goldilocks zone, you know, where the anxieties are not out of control? And so, I think another part of the fear of um, fear of the flow is that the, the thought that you'll begin a task and be interrupted because being interrupted when you're yeah. in the flow is absolutely painful. It's awful, isn't it? When you're kind of absolutely there and then you have to suddenly go away because you've got to deal with, uh, I don't know first water main yeah. or, or, or whatever or or you're called away to a meal time and it's just you know you know that you're going to lose the, the the flow and you will you will not find the lost chord or or complete yeah. your sonnet <laughs> or or whatever you know you won't score that goal because your, your mum's calling you back home whatever you so know. True. Um, interruption is a terrible thing and bad usability is something that disrupts flow i know this for me this is where it kind of comes into that workflow yeah. learning thing is that you have to make it make make sure that people are not interrupted by by a bad process that destroys their flow state no those right. observations are spot on that the, the i was laughing away there though as you know when you're writing you're holding several ideas in your head and you're trying to juggle order and, mm. and you know, expression. And somebody pops their head around the door and wants to ask you a question about what would you like for supper or something, you know? And it, it annoys you so yeah. much and you want to say, don't do this. And it seems so rude to them, but you know inside that you yeah. lose what you're thinking unless you do that. So interruption is the enemy of flow. I would, I, you know, absolutely agree with that. Now, applying this to UX design, Again, Nass and Reeves were really specific on this. Their 35 studies mm. in the media equation where the premise was it's you know that computers are a bit like real life. We treat them as human beings. And when they're impolite or you get latency or you know you get a, a lip sync problem, something, it really throws you. It's like an interruption. Yeah. It disrupts you cognitively because it, you know, it, it takes you out of the flow. And a lot of good UX design, I think, now is precisely about that it's not necessarily making things look great it's about keeping you cognitively going without obvious well why on earth did why on earth did that just happen you know that those frustrations you get with bad mm. interface design and the same is true in online learning in general i think the sort of learning experience has more to do with good design of flow than suddenly interrupting me with a little speech bubble or a multiple choice question or something you know and I think that's where yeah. a lot of design goes awry. So, yeah, we have a lot to learn from this concept of flow. And, of course, it's the key second syllable of workflow. And we've been talking about workflow yeah. learning and learning in the flow of work has become a big deal. But here we have a major theorist who was writing about this in the 1990s. So, you know, this, is, this stuff's not new. It's been with us for a long time. So time to sum up and just a couple of thoughts of mine before we get onto your, I think, much more informed thoughts. Some of the themes here we've seen in previous episodes, I think, training as something not separated from work, but integrated with it. Learning as a process, not an event. The move to greater le learner agency through technology, how important agency 
of the learner is to, to learning and focus on performance, a word which has come up again and again to, throughout these last few um, episodes. But surprising to me theme that came up with this one really is time, the way that technology has moved the focus on learning away from the focus on place, which you get with classroom and training centre. And it was the, the Julian Stodd interview I did that made me think about this because he has a, a workplace. So we move away from classrooms, training centres, bricks and mortar places to a focus on time. And it, I think it's significant, Jay, Jay Cross's internet time blog. I never quite understood why he called it internet time. Perhaps you can um, enlighten me on that, uh, Donald. And especially with flow, we've talked about the elastic sense of time you get with the flow, set, flow state and how dealing with time within the sense of, 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 of work and UX and all the rest of it becomes such a key part of things. So movement from place to time. And then again, the informal word makes it all seem a bit intangible and perhaps nebulous, you know, informal. Is this stuff you do in your flip flops and Hawaiian shirt? Um, should we perhaps call it non non formal learning? But then you've said there is another category called non formal learning. When you look at everything that's come out of this, though, um, out of informal 702010 workflow learning, LXPs, curation and so on, everything you've mentioned, it feels like a pretty significant movement in workplace learning has resulted over the last couple of decades. Um, so how would you sum up the significance of informal learning, Donald? I think you've nicely hung our hat here on the word time. I like to bounce off that for a minute mm. because I think it's right. I think learning has suffered and still suffers from what, what I call the tyranny of time. So the tyranny of time is that I have to be at a certain place at a certain time to learn something. Well, actually, I might not be in the mood, you know, I might have slept in that day. I, I find I learn a lot more uh, either in the morning or very late at night, for example, which is why a lot of students never bother turning up for nine o'clock lectures. So the tyranny of time manifests itself as fixed lectures in universities, periods in schools, that school bell ringing every hour, trundling up and down corridors to fit in the timetable and so on. Interestingly, MC worked on uh, on Montessori schools and thought that flow was best shown in Montessori uh, in the Montessori mm. context. So the tyranny of time also applies to workplace learning. You have to turn up like a big batch of employees turn up to some hotel or classroom and have to stay there for half a day, a day, two days or whatever to do a course. When actually real needs need to be freed from this tyranny of fixed timetabling. Uh, another thing that Bloom talked about way back in the day was this notion to time to completion, the idea that we give people a certain amount, you know, you've got a term to learn this, we give you an exam at the end, if you fail, that's it. That's ridiculous. Different people, it's not that people are smart or stupid, just some people, people are just faster and slower. So if we recategorize people as faster and slower, give them the time to reach competence, free learning from the tyranny of time. Now, how do we do that? Well, we shift it online. Almost all technology shifts in the history of learning have been attempts to free people from the tyranny of both place and time. We suddenly have, uh, which is why, I, you know, I'm not too fond on synchronous communication, for example. I don't watch synchronous lectures and I don't like it much when I have to answer the telephone. This podcast will be asynchronous. People can watch it whenever they want, walking mm. the dog, exercising in the car as they do. We don't care. We've freed the podcast from the tyranny of time. Yeah. And that's why it's much more useful, accessible and interesting and motivationally satisfying for people. So I think all of this stuff about informal learning is precisely about time. Uh, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up as, as a word. It's been a bugbear in mind for years. I think the history of of learning has been a pendulum swing away from the tyranny of time to the tyranny, to the to the promotion of informal, motivated, learner-led, learner-centric view of the world. And that's what the technology is giving us. Mm. It, the, the technology is giving us that context, those powerful tools to do this, which is why content is no longer content delivered as a course. It's self-paced, it should be when you need it, when you want it. That's why Bob Mosher stuff is so important, why performance support matters, informal, incidental, accidental learning has to be supported with the right ecosystem. 
and that ecosystem is largely technology. Hmm. When I first scanned this list of people, I thought the flow one th at the end, um, the, <laughs> the MC, um, struck me as the kind of odd person out, didn't understand how it fitted in. But you having said that makes absolute sense that if your focus is moving to uh, informal learning, uh, learning in the flow of work, information in the flow of work, flow is the essential important dimension that you have to look at. How can we allow people to be in the flow, to, to, to work and learn simultaneously sometimes with, with, within yeah, that Yeah, and flow. I think, you know, if, you're really, if we're really looking at what we should be doing now in the workplace, then this pendulum swing away from turning your time and place towards support or performance support. Remember those two important words? You know, Bob Mosher is right on mm -hmm. this sort of stuff. People like Alfred Remitz have been doing this for decades. You know, it was actually support for IT support in the 1990s. They were the big new thing. But we need support on all sorts of things in the workplace now. Almost everything needs some sort of support. Mm. You know, that was traditional performance support. It's now gone much wider. And courses are not enough now. They're too clumsy a tool, like a big hammer, of course. You need a whole range of tools, you know, different uh, screwdrivers and all sorts of things there, or like the Swiss Army knife type thing. You know, courses have their place, but their inflexibility mm. in terms of time and place is often a constraint, as is the money we spend on them. If we only, as J. Cross advised mm. us in the, uh, way back then, thought about spreading our budget into different arenas, which many L&D departments are now doing, I think you get massive increase in return on investment. So resources, not courses, Nick Shackleton-Jones line, that's one dimension. Performance support is another. LXPs is another. Uh, you know, there's two clicks and 10 seconds to get to something from Bob Mosher and Alfred Remitz, expertise, these, these things, you know, we, and we know a lot more. We're gathering data about people. We know about their job role, who they are and what they're doing. So we can have a guess at the context a little bit more. This is happening and will continue to happen to swing the pendulum away from fit, the tyranny of time towards a, a real learning organization is one in which learning in a sense is almost made invisible. Within this, uh, this season, especially for the last few episodes, we've been developing themes. And I think this episode rounds it off nicely um, in, in, in the way that you put things there. Um, next time we'll be moving on to something which will seem like a bit of a handbrake turn. I think we go for another origin story, we're going to begin to talk about the Greeks. But for this episode, Donald, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer. Sound edit is by Isaac Peacock. Social media by Jay Curtis. The podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark and would like to thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project. In our next episode, the last of this second season, Donald and John turn back the millennia when they take on some foundational figures of human thought. What do the Greeks have to tell us about learning? Join us, won't you?